All right, in this video, we're going to be covering chapter six, section five, which covers intermolecular forces. Just as a little preface, I'm not gonna be covering this part of this section that covers uh, molecular geometry because uh, I can't properly do justice to the three-dimensional shapes of molecules in this 2D medium. But for the intermolecular forces, I feel I can properly uh, discuss the material within the context of these videos. So let's get into it. Uh, first of all, intermolecular forces measure uh, interactions between uh, molecules. So it's not uh, within the bonds of, say, these two molecules. It's measuring the force of how one affects the other. And the way chemists usually measure how uh, strongly uh, two molecules will attached to one another is by boiling them because if these molecules are sort of vibrating in the liquid state and then they heat them up further so that they eventually float away into the gas state once they're in this gas state they have uh, properly separated from all the molecules surrounding them and they can measure the energy released by this and the amount of energy that it took to uh, get these molecules to escape in order to measure uh, how much force attach them to one another. And just as a quick rule of thumb, the higher boiling point of a substance, such as a metal or ionic compound, uh, the more or the stronger the intermolecular forces between them because it takes a higher temperature and therefore more vibrating energy around these molecules to get them to separate. And as a general rule, you'll find that uh, metallic metallic compounds uh, tend to have the highest uh, boiling points followed by ionic compounds and then lastly uh, molecular compounds. Alright so dipole-dipole forces are forces between polarized molecules and uh, these polarized molecules are called dipoles which are uh, molecules with equal but opposite charges on either end that are separated by a very short distance, usually the length of the molecule. And so how you would write a dipole is you would write the formula for a compound. Let's take uh, iodine chloride and you draw a sort of a uh, Lewis structure with the dash in the middle representing the uh, bond and then you would write the positive at one end with an arrow extending towards the negative end. So in this instance the dipole has a positive iodine, iodine uh, atom and a negative chlorine atom. And this is easy to remember because you can just look at the periodic table and the arrow will always point towards the more electronegative element. So if you have a bunch of dipole molecules in a solution or in a solid, uh, they'll orient themselves so that uh, their polar regions, which are charged, will uh, attract the oppositely charged regions of adjacent molecules. So these are very short range forces only affecting the adjacent molecules. You'll notice that uh, the negative end of this dipole over here isn't super attracted to the positive end of this one over here. And these short range forces only work between adjacent molecules and they're called dipole-dipole forces as written at the top. And they're responsible for a stronger bond than typical uh, intermolecular forces. Which means that uh, dipole uh, compounds will tend to have a higher boiling point. For example, uh, iodine chloride has a boiling point of 97 degrees Celsius. Whereas if you were to take uh, diatomic bromine, which of course has an electronegativity difference of zero because it's the same element and therefore isn't polar and doesn't have these dipole-dipole bonds, uh, it has a much lower boiling point of just 59 degrees Celsius. So iodine chloride is kind of a simple example of a dipole system because it only has one bond that dictates its polarity. If you look at a more complex molecule, like let's say uh, 
water, which we know has two hydrogens and one oxygen. When you look at the polarity difference, because oxygen is more electronegative, it'll tend to take away from the hydrogen electrons and attract them more towards the oxygen, so they spend more time over here. These two uh, dipoles within the same molecule uh, are additive, so oxygen in this molecule will be very negative over here, and these two hydrogens will tend to be very positive. Now, the same thing is true with subtraction. If you were to have two dipoles oriented oppositely within a molecule, like let's say within carbon dioxide, which we know is carbon in the middle with two oxygens on either end, the oxygens, because they're more electronegative, will tend to orient a dipole uh, towards them, causing them to take uh, carbon's electrons more of the time than it will have them. However, because these two effects cancel out, the net dipole on this is zero. So carbon dioxide is a nonpolar compound. Some dipoles, however, if they're strong enough, can also uh, induce uh, slight polarity in otherwise nonpolar molecules. For example, in diatomic oxygen, if it gets close to a uh, water molecule, particularly the positive hydrogen dipole, uh, what will happen is that the electrons in the shared orbital will tend to spend more time over here, making this end negative and this end positive. Now, these, this doesn't make the oxygen molecule uh, completely uh, a dipole. However, it makes it polar enough where this oxygen molecule can then become soluble in water. So under the umbrella of uh, dipole interactions, there are some compounds that tend to have very high boiling points compared to uh, other similar compounds. And this is because those compounds tend to contain hydrogen uh, attached to very electronegative elements such as fluorine, oxygen, or nitrogen. Now, what happens is that because these elements are so electronegative, and hydrogen only has one electron, it almost gives up its electron entirely to these elements within these uh, bonds, and that leaves pretty much a lone proton, and then what is almost a negative ion over here. So it's fluorine that has an extra electron most of the time connected to another proton. Now, if you have a solution of something very similar to this, you'll end up with a very polar substance because this lone proton doesn't have any electron shielding around it to offer you know, uh, a balance out for this large positive charge. And these hydrogen bonds between various molecules are usually represented by a dotted line. So here I'll put a bunch of oxygen and then add the hydrogen in their proper places. So it would be represented by a dotted line representing uh, the hydrogen, or at least the lone proton out here, its attraction to the negative uh, polarized side of the uh, water dipole. So the final intermolecular force we're going to be covering in this video are the uh, London dispersion forces. And the London dispersion forces occur in all atoms regardless of uh, whether they have a full octet or are highly reactive. And they're due to the random motion of electrons. So let's say we have a helium atom. We'll say that's the nucleus. And it has two electrons in the cloud around it. Now, because electrons are in constant motion and there's a certain uncertainty to their location, at any point, this electron could be over here, or this one could be over here, or they could both be down here, etc. And what this means is that uh, the randomness of the electrons can cause a slight uh, charge on one end. So let's say this electron moved over to the right side,
there would be a slight negative charge over on this side leading to a slight positive charge over on this side, which would affect, say, an adjacent atom over here, causing it to be slightly polarized as well. Now this leads to uh, small attractions uh, between adjacent molecules. However, just as it can randomly form a dipole, it can just as easily disassociate into a neutral atom once again, which means that London dispersion forces are very weak and very temporary. And this means that things that rely on London dispersion forces to hold themselves together as uh, liquids, such as the noble gases, like helium, argon, neon, etc., have very low boiling points because there's not much attractive force between them at all, only due to this small London dispersion force.